Hi, everybody. I'm Gold Derby News and Features Editor Ray Richmond, and I'm here today with Mark Johnson, the Oscar-nominated producer of the Alexander Payne-directed feature, The Holdovers. Uh, you know, Mark, I was thinking about this uh, before we got on the Zoom. There's so much debate about the you know Academy Award nominees and their quality, and but I don't think I've spoken with anyone who doesn't love your film. Um, how did it feel to get a Best Picture nomination? Well, to say that it's overwhelming is sort of understating it. It's um, it, it's pretty fascinating. You know, it's really um, um, it's just sort of a the, the certification that the film is working for a for a large large audience, and given that it's Academy members, a discerning audience. So it uh, it's really what you want. You want to know that people like what you, what you what you made and what you're saying. And um, we're hearing that certainly with the nomination. So I'm very, and I mean this sincerely, I'm very humbled and, and very happy. Was there um, any sense of vindication in getting five Oscar nominations? Because the holdovers was, uh, from what I gather in your previous interviews, such a tough film to set up and distribute. Yeah, it, it is, of course, because you know, Every movie's hard to make. Um, and, you know, nobody sets out to make a bad movie and any number of things can happen. So the confluence of all of these things aligning, coming together, and then producing a movie that audiences seem to like as much of this is, you know, a minor miracle and also couldn't be more rewarding. Is there a... Is there anyone that you called up after you got the five nominations and went, see, I told you. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I don't think, of course, I, I don't gloat much anyhow. So, uh, but uh, no, I think I called people and said, can you believe it? You've, uh, you've actually really been at this quite a while now, Mark. Uh, has it grown progressively tougher to sell the kind of character-driven human stories you specialize in as a producer like The Holdovers? Um, I'm supposed to say, yes, it has gotten <laughs> more difficult. And that's probably- Or you could just tell me the truth. Oh, no, 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 when I'm a producer. Why would I do that? <laughs> uh, I, I um, it, you know, it is more difficult, and yet at the same time, we managed to do it. And people will often tell you now that these stories, these sort of very small character stories, now are being done more on television than they are doing, certainly for the major studios. But there's a number of smaller independent companies that really believe in these things. And every year, there is some smaller, unexpected movie that you you know, somehow breaks through and, and sort of reconfirms everything. Yeah, that's true. A lot of these things, the smaller and more human story sort of movies are moving to the small screen or, you know, with with everything, uh, everything going to streaming, um, as it certainly did during the pandemic. Uh, yeah. You know, you get a lot of it there. But, you know, I was looking at your resume before we started uh, talking here, and it's pretty remarkable, Mark. You, You've produced everything, Diner, to Tin Man, to The Natural, to Bugsy, to Rain Man, which you won an Oscar for, and now The Holdovers. Uh, how does this latest film rank in terms of the experience of making? Well, I still, you know what, I still, I so love what I'm doing. I feel like every day I still feel like a, you know, a young, a young boy who can't believe he's allowed to do this, you know, and, and uh, it. Somebody asked me if you know this the Oscar nomination were old hat to me, and not at all. Are you kidding? I'm thrilled, and I don't expect it. And you know, always there are a number of movies I've made that that I think are very good and haven't been recognized. And that's it's not that it's fair or unfair. It's just the way it is. And I, but I love the idea, partly because I so believe in Alexander Payne. And what he's done with David Hemmingson, who wrote this screenplay, and and this trio of actors, it's just uh, it's pretty remarkable. And the fact that it's being recognized the way it is uh, 
just confirms my, you know, my early, my very early suspicions about the project. What's so uh, unique about this film, I think, Mark, uh, the choice not only to set it in 1970, but uh, to make it look like it was actually made in the 70s and set on a shelf gathering dust. Was that Alexander's idea or uh, kind of a committee decision thing? That was Alexander's idea. And he, you know, he wanted to make a movie that wasn't only this, you know, that didn't look like a, a 70s film that actually felt like it was made in the 70s. So that's why we, you can, by the way, you can tell how film wise the audience is from the very first image, because some people will start to laugh when they see that fight, fake Miramax, that fake, uh, quite frankly, you know, MPAA rating. It's now called the MPA, but the rating, the rating that we put on the film is from the MPAA. And it's the old, the old logo. And then you have a, a faux logo for Miramax and for Focus. And you can get some people will laugh and some people don't know that that's not the real, you know, the real identification. How sly of you to separate the cinephiles from the rest of us yeah. through the simple flashing of a logo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I actually did catch some of that, and it was and it was really fun and you know almost a little Easter egg for uh, for the people in the know. Um, right. It's interesting that uh, Focus features. Speaking of Focus, I bought the holdovers and then sat on it for a year. Usually well, that means, you know, there's something wrong with the film. They're trying to dump it and cut their losses, but that clearly wasn't their thinking. No, what happens is they saw it in September at the Toronto Film Festival. We weren't part of the festival, but we showed it there to, um, um, basically we showed it there to uh, to distributors for somebody to pick it up. And uh, we... Um, they immediately said we want it in 24 hours they made a deal i was hoping that they would release it that you know three months later at christmas because it was um uh, one i was so proud of it and i wanted it out there and then i wanted uh i thought the competition was sort of weak and we had a good chance in many ways commercially wards wise and luckily focus was correct they said, no, we need the time to mount the right kind of campaign and and release it properly, which, of course, they did. It was very hard to sit on my hands for over a year to wait for it to come out. But it it ended up making the most sense. So you really wanted to kind of rush it out and thought, well, good, we have just enough time before the end of the year to get an awards campaign. Though. Right. That's exactly right. Um, but thankfully, clearer heads than yours prevailed. <laughs> I, I I fully admit that I was wrong. <laughs> um, Paul Giamatti, uh, uh, Mark, is so good in this movie. Funny, poignant, just masterful. Was there ever anyone else considered to play Paul on him in this film? Not at all. The uh, um, Alexander said from the very beginning it was Paul, only Paul. He wouldn't even listen to other names. Needless to say, and I won't say whom, there are people who said, well, what about and come up with some big AAA movie star? And Alexander says, nope, nope, it's Paul. It's got to be Paul. And I think he told Paul early on that he was preparing a movie for him. So Ironically, Alexander, I, I, Alexander I, had wanted to work with him again after Sideways, of course, for a long time. Yeah, I guess it's funny that they didn't have anything before that. I was going to point out, I produced the movie Donnie Brasco and Paul was in it one day and he had a, uh, when he was just starting his career and he did had a scene with uh, Johnny Depp when Johnny Depp was explaining to him what forget about it meant. Wow. Huh. I but, just, uh, yeah, you know, there's no one that acts better with their just facial expressions, I think, than Giamatti. Uh, he might he might be uh, our greatest actor working today in film. By the way, uh, Alexander will definitely won't even would take the might out of that. He says the best actor working in America today is Paul Giamatti. 
Yeah, I I actually agree. Well, uh, well, and the Oscar nomination helps confirm that. Uh, did uh, did Devine Joy Randolph land down your radar from radar from uh, Dolomite? Is my name when I, when I spoke to her, she admitted she'd actually never heard of Alexander Payne when he called her, but you know she turned out clearly to be the right choice. Right. Uh, well, Alexander loved Dolomite is my name and reminded me that that's what she was in. And I remember how much I liked her and I knew her mostly from comedy. You know, she has a recurring part on only murders in the building and a couple of other things. And, um, and yet she, um, you know, I don't know. It's so interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that about her not knowing who Alexander Payne was, but it makes sense. I'm sure her uh, representation at the time said, oh my God, you've got to work with Alexander Payne. And she said, who? She did. When she was on the phone with him and she's like, oh, you, you did that uh, that movie about the wine, right? And then, uh, you know, she, she put two and two together. <laughs> but, but it took a little while to get there. Yeah. And uh, clearly Alexander was not offended by that. Um, no, and, not at all. Uh, it takes a lot to offend him. Uh, and now, um, Devine is, you know, uh, something of a of a favorite, certainly in our odds here at Gold Derby, to um, you know to win uh, Best Supporting Actress for this film. Uh, well deserved. Uh, you know what a performance. I mean, because it's it's not showy. It's not like there's one scene where she just completely knocks it out of the park. It's just seems to be consistently powerful. I, I think that's true. I talked to somebody the other day who had lost a child and she said the first time you see her in the movie and she's in the kitchen and she looks out the window as the snow is falling and you see the sadness in her eyes. She said, that's a character who's lost a child. And I think you're absolutely right. There's no one grandstanding scene that proclaims her the, you know, such a great actress. It's just the accumulation, and you know, there are individual scenes when she's at the uh, the bureau and is putting away her son's baby clothes. Um, it's it's sort of heartbreaking, but overall, she just it's a real character who gets you from the very beginning. Yeah, it's the consistent molding of the character. I mean, by the end of the film. Uh, Mark, I think you feel like you're sort of inside of her soul, you know, yeah. and, and it stays with you. I think that's true. And um, Dominic Sessa, uh, I'd actually predicted he'd get an Oscar nomination, you know, which proves what I know. But um, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to use the S word, you know, snub, uh, which everyone used. But what a performance from a kid who had literally never acted on film before. I know. His father may have, you know, taken home movies of him at Thanksgiving, but that's it. He's never been on film. And he was so self-assured and yet never cocky, very humble by it. And um, he just was always there, always ready, didn't presume anything. And um, Alexander took him under his wing would have him come to his house at the end of each shooting day, not each day, but many of them, and would show him movies from the 70s. Like which movies? A lot of Hal Ashby stuff. He hadn't seen The Last Detail. He hadn't seen, uh, you know, um, Harold and Maude. He had a number of movies that sort of just spoke of this, both the style and the pace of the movies of the 70s. Were, were you... Um... A little nervous, uh, even after we screen tested and hired him and every proven himself that uh, this guy straight out of uh, a college acting department uh, could step into the big leagues and oh sure consistently knock it out of the park. Sure, uh, you know we did what's called a chemistry read with with Paul Giamatti, and he was great, and everybody said, "Oh, this kid, perfect." But you still, is he going to be able to keep up a 45-day schedule? How's he going to be when he's got 75 people looking and a camera lens looking at him? And, um, you know, probably the first couple of weeks we didn't, you know, we we were on tender hooks. But the truth of the matter is he, um, he um, 
confirmed everything we uh, we wanted from him. Do you ever weigh in uh, heavily, uh, Mark, on casting decisions? I mean, is this, you know, do you, like, do you, can you look back at your, at your, uh, you know, your film career and think, well, you know, I really had a, a hand in that, in in having that person in this in this film, or, or, you know, yeah, sometimes you know, sometimes uh, some more than others. You know, there are certain actors that I, I feel very not entirely responsible for, but feel that my suspicions about them were right from the beginning. And then I've been wrong with, with others. You know, um, uh, I produced the movie, the movie uh, Galaxy Quest, and I think every single actor in that movie is perfect for the part. And there are a number of us who just went along with it all along. We had a great casting director, Debbie Zane, and Dean Pariso was the director. And But it, it is a movie in which I just can't imagine any other actor playing any of those parts. I didn't know you did Galaxy Quest. Wow, that was you know one one of those one of those great uh, uh, great little sweeper films that ended up doing incredibly well and was was so charming and fun. Yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's it's true, but but I feel that the. I feel that the holdovers is so delicate, you know, it's it's sort of a, what you'd call a, a, a landmine movie. Any false step and the whole thing blows up. And yet every step, every casting choice, every, you know, scene, it just all sort of works in tandem. And so it, it is. They often say nobody sets out to make a bad movie. There are a lot of people who started off with a very good movie and it turned into a bad movie. And so you just have to, that's why you can never, you can never fall back and say, okay, we're in good shape now. It's until the last day of shooting, you've got to uh, stay on your toes. A landmine movie. That's a very interesting way of putting it. I, although I would imagine there's a lot of landmine movies. Where, I think so. Where, I think so. There's some movies, there are some big event movies where you can say you can have a terrible piece of casting. It doesn't really matter. You know, the rest of it works fine. But something like this, if one of those three actors had not been good, the whole movie would have suffered. Yeah. Or like if you if if there had been an unfortunate story choice, like, you know, having Paul's and Dave Vine's characters you know like sweep together and then realize this was a bad idea right right <laughs> okay it's good that we cut that scene out then <laughs> you know this was um i guess this was uh alexander's first film since downsizing which uh I, and i know you were involved in that which got a little bit of a lukewarm reaction right um, was there any kind of worry about or did alexander feel like he had to sort of even though he's something of a legend as a director at this point kind of reprove himself with the holdovers no i don't think so the beauty of him he is so confident and i don't mean self confident or full of he just knew about his instincts and i think i think he learned a lot from downsizing not like oh i shouldn't do this again he didn't enjoy all of the visual effects so i don't think he'll you'll see him doing a big effects movie again in the near future, um, but he's 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 an American. He's an American humorist. He's almost like a, I don't know. He's a, he's a cinematic. I don't know. You just think of the the so many of our uh, wonderful writers who tell very gentle stories about characters with a certain amount of. Um, it was like Mark Twain, I think, where he'll tell a a story, a somewhat simple story about characters and have real humor in it, but very natural humor. And I think, uh, I think he's a, he borders on an, an, a national treasure, but don't tell him I said that. I, I agree with you. Uh, and a lot of it is his obsession because he grew up in the seventies with seventies film and seven kind of seventies style. Right. Uh, right. Like Tarantino, but clearly a much different director than Tarantino. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. but similar sort of obsession with the seventies, um, uh, and I know you've gotten 
you've almost you've been heartened and almost a little surprised from what I gather, uh, Mark, at the response you've gotten to the holdovers with people c still calling and emailing and talking about how much they love the film. Has that caught you a little off guard? Sure, it has. I mean, I knew it was a good movie. I knew it was a good movie for me. That doesn't mean that everybody else is going to agree. And uh, I didn't realize how it was going to touch people. And I think the idea of these three lonely orphans in their way, misfits, connecting, and this what happens over the course of two weeks, not only do they feel differently about the other two characters, but each one feels differently about herself, himself. Absolutely. To make it, it's by the end, you feel it makes you feel good to be alive, which um, exactly right. And we, it makes we, we, feel, we need more of those. I feel I think honestly it's a it's a terrible catchword, but I think it's very important today. It makes you feel hopeful. Absolutely. Um I think we're gonna leave things there. Uh the holdovers is playing in theaters and streaming over Peacock. Mark Johnson, best of luck to you at the Academy Awards on March 10th. And thanks for joining us at Gold Derby. Ray, thank you very much. It was a pleasure.